welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is the next instalment in the incredible series by Jack LaFontaine. As ever, please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Death Rides the Red Part 2 Let's get straight into that. Nate crashed back in wakefulness. He was covered in cold sweat and gasping for breath. And when the sound of his heart stopped hammering in his ears, he realised he could still hear a distant howling. He slipped his coat from its holster and padded out onto the porch. His ears were not deceiving him nor his mind playing tricks. And far to the east, the howling voice of a wolf called out again. Nate walked back into the house and returned the coat to the holster, hanging from his bedpost. He wiped the soles of his wet feet on his legs and crawled back into bed. He thought any further sleep that night was unlikely. Unwilling to give in to the monster in his nightmare, he gave it another try. He was wrong about sleep. His next memory was the rattle of the pans in the kitchen. He pulled on his denim breeches and stepped into his boots before stumbling into the kitchen. Dang, Captain, y'all look done in, Jimmy said. You sleep poorly? Well, I feel like I've been kicked in the head by a mule. How that howling keep you awake? Jimmy asked. So, you heard it too? Couldn't help but hear it. I thought I was dreaming. Nate rubbed his aching head. Now I know I've been mule kicked. The door swung open on a dripping rafe berry. He limped to the table and dropped down with a grunt. His eyes were bloodshot and his mouth drawn down at the corners. My yaws and lively twosome this morning, Jimmy said. Coffee, Rafe growled. A few sips of Jimmy's hot black coffee brought Rafe around and seemed to lift his spirit. His frown disappeared and he balanced the hot cup on his knee to help him ease the throbbing there. The warmth slowly did its work and Rafe became human once again. What a miserable night, Rafe said. This leg kept me awake dang near all night. And when it finally did ease up, dang it if it wasn't wolves, started howling. How long has it been since y'all heard wolves around here? Gotta be at least three years, Jimmy said. Well, I've never heard wolves howl around here. I thought they were all gone, Nate added. Make that four years then, Jimmy said. Well, I guess it's possible, Rafay said. This place used to be slap dab in the middle of the wolf run. I suppose there might be a few still around. If there are, they got the right to raise a ruckus same as anybody. But why did they have to pick last night? Rafay moaned. I guess you won't be going fishing today, Nate said. Well, I'm hurting, and I'm tired, Rafay said. I ain't dead, darn tootin', I'm going fishing. You know, you don't look so purty this morning yourself. Well, bad dreams, Nate answered. Life on the Lazy L was solitary by design. Rafay had his fishing and Jimmy was a natural recluse. Nate shied away from town and went out of his way to avoid the town's business and its gossip. To his way of thinking, Nate had done a lifetime of travelling, socialising, politicking and killing during the war. He preferred his own company and minding his own business. Since Governor Davis pulled in the Texas Rangers from chasing Comanches to help push a peaceful reconstruction, Nate stayed even closer to home. He was an ex-Confederate officer, and his grumbling on political matters was rightly taken as a dislike for both the Reconstruction and 
Yankee sympathizers. Discretion being the better part of valour, he opted for isolation over confrontation. The lazy L saw few visitors. It wasn't that visitors weren't welcomed, they just weren't invited. Consequently, the three riders now approaching up the road from Texoma were a surprise. The men of the Lazy L weren't big on surprises. Jimmy, get your shotgun, Nate said through the open door. I see him, Captain, he replied. Keep out of sight with that thing, Nate cautioned. Yes, sir, Captain. Nate recognized the men while they were still at a distance. The approaching riders were Texoma's sheriff, Sam Bryan, and his deputies, Jason Conroe and Bill Simpson. The arrival of the local police force did little to ease Nate's suspicion of impending trouble. Brian rode into Nate's dooryard with a friendly touch of his hat. The three lawmen wore the haggard look of men who had spent too many hours in the saddle. Nate's actively growing mistrust of authority began at Appomattox and not called over the intervening years. Sheriff Brian was an exception to the rule. Nate genuinely liked Sam. Brian had been a cadet at the Virginia Military Institute when the Old Dominion succeeded in 61. He left school to serve in his soon-to-be famous instructor's brigade. And Sam lived through three years of war unscathed until he was ordered to charge the Union Center at Gettysburg. He was one of the lucky ones. Sam left Gettysburg in the back of a hospital wagon. He lived to tell the tale of the famous charge and add it to the horrors he had suffered in a Yankee prisoner of war camp. Like Nate, he drifted west after the war. With the aid of John Hotchkiss, Sam stumbled into the newly created jobs of sheriff in Texoma. Brian was a perfect choice. He was patient, caring man who took no shit from anyone. His fearlessness wasn't just a legend, it was fact. Sam stood just five foot six. His soft features and tousled blonde hair and clean-shaven face gave him a boyish appearance. The look lent a full sense of security to the uninformed and undiscerning. Many of those mistaken enough to push Sam Bryan into a fight now populated Texoma's cemetery. Man, if we step down and talk to you, Nate? Sam asked. I don't mind a bit, Sheriff. Nate answered, appreciating there was still a man with manners enough to ask. Sam Bryan swung down from the saddle and handed his reins to Simpson. Conroe did the same. Jason Conroe wasn't much older than Jimmy Weston. He was known in Texoma as an excellent horseman and had once entertained youthful dreams of being the Confederacy's next Jeb Stuart. However, the war ended in the East before Jason was old enough to pursue his ambitions. Frustrated, he rode north into Indian territory to join the stand wait. The white-haired general only told the boy to go home and try and make peace. And Jason went, but peace eluded him. He was constantly spoiling for a fight, and his brawling quickly wore on the nerves of Texoma's new sheriff. One Saturday night in a Lone Star saloon, Jason found himself eyeball to eyeball with an angry Sam Bryan. He was a breath away from drawing on Bryan when the sheriff gave him a nearly indiscernible shake of his head. The gesture brought Jason to his senses, into Sam Bryan's service, and now to Nate Carson's door. How about some uh, coffee? Nate asked. No thanks, Bryan replied. Can't stay long. We got some trouble. Well, what kind of trouble brings the entire police force of Texoma to my door? Well, I forgive my manners, but I'll get right to it. Henry and John Hotchkiss have been murdered, Brian said. What? Nate jumped from his seat. That can't be. I was just over there yesterday. John was fine when we pulled a plug on his new batch. That's exactly why we're here, Brian said. Nate's confused look melted away quickly, his brow knit together sending deep creases across his face. The fire kindled in his eyes and his jaws locked in place. Nate's hand dropped down alongside his gun. The look and the shift of Nate's body prompted the sheriff to hurry his explanation. No offense, Sam said. 
It's just that we found only one set of tracks in or out of the rocking hatch and they led straight here. I went over to get a bull John sold me. As I said, he was fine. We had a couple of snorts and I rode back home. I didn't see Henry, but I figured he was around the place somewhere. What happened? Well, I was kind of hoping that you'd tell me, the sheriff said. Well, I better ask straight out. Nate rose to his feet. Sam, are you accusing me of something? Sit down, Nate, Sam said. I ain't accusing you. Just doing my job. You are the rocking age, no doubt about it. We gotta start somewhere, and this is where the trail leads. I thought maybe you saw something or somebody out of the ordinary, and would want to help us out. Okay, Sam, Nate said, but did not sit. Look, everything was fine. John was fine. What about their cowhands? Didn't they see anything? Well, only two actually live on the place, and there's no sign of either of them anywhere. Their horses and tack are still on the rocking age, but they have flat out disappeared. We've been looking for them all morning. Well, how can that be? They can't just vanish. No, but it sure as hell looks like they did, Brian answered. I still got men riding a rocking age looking for some kind of sign of what happened. The rest of John's hands live in town and the crew building a new barn went on the place yesterday. Henry was supposed to be waiting on materials and sent them home. New barn? John didn't say anything about a new barn. Yeah, no word about it around town either, but Luke Pennington says a week or so ago, Henry started building a barn down by the river. By the river? Surely John and Henry had better sense than that, Nate said. Actually, it's back about a quarter of a mile from the river and protected by a hill. You say John didn't mention it? Not a word. Hmm. I never knew John to be secretive about such things. Anyway, the hands live in town. Luke Pennington found Henry and John when he came to work this morning. Says he found the place deserted and went in the house looking for Henry. And the sheriff visibly paled. God almighty, Nate. And Sam choked on the words. You ain't never seen nothing like this. We saw some bad shit in the war, but not like this. Not this. They were ripped to shreds. There were pieces of them thrown around the room. The whole damn place was covered in blood. Looked like dogs had been at the bodies. I lost my breakfast the minute I laid eyes on them. I looked to Nate like Sam was having a difficult time keeping down anything that might be left too. I swear, Nate, it was pure god-awful. You never seen anything like of this, Conroe added. His own efforts in dealing with the memory of the crime scene kept Sam noticing how pale his host had just become. A cold hand closed around Nate's heart. Yes, I have. Dear God, yes, I have. Nate thought and shivered involuntarily. The overcast sky rumbled in the distance as the mourners gathered for the funeral of John and Henry Hotchkiss. The earlier rain had slowed to an intermittent drizzle that pushed the crowd together under the twin oaks in the centre of the Hotchkiss family plot, and four cypress spires surrounded the giant oaks at the points of the compass and marked the boundary of the cemetery. The headstones of Hotchkiss dead, both young and old, stood in the three neat rows beneath the boughs of the huge oaks. The grass within the plot was nearly trimmed and Nate noticed that someone had placed flowers on the grave of Anna Hotchkiss. Most of the town of Texoma had slugged up the muddy road to say goodbye to John and Henry. Mourners covered a little knoll as Rev Turner read the service and the twin polished oak coffins were lowered into their places. John Hotchkiss was placed beside his beloved Anna. Henry rested on his father's right hand. End of the line, Nate thought. Only John Jr. is left and he ain't fit to carry the name. The thought sent a twinge of guilt through Nate, and he was being rather uncharitable to a man he hardly knew. Nevertheless, the fact that a man with John's position and means had not made it to his own father's funeral was commentary enough for Nate on the man's absent sense of duty 
and honor. Nate suddenly felt eyes on him and wondered if someone in the crowd had read his thoughts. He glanced quickly over the crowd and decided his imagination was getting the better of him. But the feeling of being watched wouldn't go away. He shifted slightly and took a longer look to his left. No one seemed to be paying him much mind. Nate turned his head to the right as if to scratch his ear and caught Sam Bryan studying him intently. Sam and Jason Conroe were on the edge of the crowd. And Jason was looking over the many faces standing around the coffins. Sam seemed concerned, only with Nate. Nate sighed and turned back towards the grave. He soon found himself looking at the faces too and wondering if the murderer was among the crowd. These were hard people, and there were few tears, but so lined the drawn faces that looked back at Nate. And did the folks around Texoma think he had killed John? It was a safe bet many heard the sheriff followed the trail to the Lazy L and figured as much. Nate knew that behind some of those dry eyes lurked suspicion. And he was also sure imaginations ran wild over the horrors everyone knew lay within those boxes. Details of the state of the house and bodies had leaked into the community. The mourners were afraid to see and, at the same time, desperate for a peek at the carnage. Curiosity and carnage were strange bedfellows in the human mind. Nate had no such inner conflict. He fought hard to drive such thoughts away. What he couldn't drive away was the feeling that he already knew the sight. He wished to God he didn't. Hard on the heels of this thought came another. Every mourner had to be thinking. If this could happen to John and Henry Hotchkiss, no one in Texoma was safe. Nate wondered if the inner turmoil on his face was evident to Sam Bryan. Sam had a good poker face. Jeremy Wentworth did not. The Undertaker was studying Nate too closely for mild curiosity. Unlike others in the crowd, Wentworth did not glance away when Nate met his eyes. Nate considered Wentworth a friend. His look made Nate feel uneasy. Rather than anger or fear, he looked puzzled. Jeremy looked as if he knew what cards Nate was holding and couldn't believe what he saw. At last, the preacher said, Amen. And the crowd of mourners broke apart. After handshakes and subdued snacks and conversations, people drifted back towards their homes. Raphae and Jimmy went to bring the horses around, and Nate found Sam Bryan standing at his elbow. Together, they watched in silence as red Texas dirt was shoveled into the graves. John Hotchkiss got me this job, Sam said. Yep, Nate replied. He introduced me to you, Ellie too, Nate nodded. I mean to see whoever did this hang for it. Good luck, Sam. You're gonna need it. Nate turned and walked away without waiting for a reply. He climbed up on the little Joe and nudged the big black horse towards the lazy L. Sam and Jason watched them right away, and Sam puzzled over Nate's parting words. It wasn't an omission, but he was convinced Nate knew more than he was telling. The men of the lazy L rode around a bend in the road and out of the lawman's sight. The road entered a stand of oak and hackberry trees that pressed in close and hung over the road blocking out what little grey light that filtered through the clouds. Under the shelter in trees, Nate again felt eyes on him. His hackles rose, his heart leaped to gallop, and a thousand bugs crawled over his skin. Damn it all, he was being watched. Lil Joe sensed it too. The black ears lay flat against his head and Nate fought to keep the big horse from bolting. Nate turned to see if Sam was following him, only empty road stretched out behind him. Nate scanned left and then right, but saw no one. What the hell is it? Raphae whispered. Dunno, but I don't like it, Jimmy answered. Just keep moving, Nate said. A chill filled the air and rattled the branches overhead. 
and the wind kicked up out of the north and sent leaves raining down on the men of the lazy owl. Nate suddenly felt cold, but it was not the wind that chilled his blood. He was not sure by who or what. Sam Bryan's men continued to search for the missing cowhands. It would be three days before various parts of the men began washing up downstream from the Rockin' H. Meanwhile, news of the gruesome murders of the Rockin' H spread up and down the river. News of the murders brought a second set of visitors to the Lazy L. Their arrival came as no surprise to the owner of the Lazy L. Nate was sure someone would come. He wasn't quite sure if it would be these two, but he knew it would be someone like them. Their arrival confirmed Nate's suspicions about who or what killed John and Henry Hotchkiss. This visit was definitely less welcome than Sam Bryan's. The arrival of these two meant that there was real trouble brewing, and Nate could not avoid it. Jack Morgan and Nick Corbin rode out of the trees north of Nate's home. They crossed the river onto the Lazy L, rather than take the ferry and be seen in town, Nate thought. Well, I'll be damned if it ain't Nate Carson, after all, Jack smiled. How's the hell are you? Not worth a darner, getting worse all the time, Nate answered. You Texans ain't very friendly, Jack said. Yeah, Nate, we're glad to see you, ain't we, Jack? Nick did his best to sound wounded, but didn't quite carry it off. Damn right we are, Jack confirmed. Well, I'm glad you boys are so all fired happy, Nate replied. We kind of thought you might be glad to see us, Nick said. We heard you got some trouble. We kind of thought we might be able to help. Well, hell, Nate said. Come on down from there and let's get drunk. Now you're talking sense, Jack smiled. Guess that means them two inside can put away their guns. Jimmy, Rafay, y'all put down those guns and bring us a joke. I want you to meet some old friends, Nate called. Jack and Nick tied up their horses and climbed the stairs to the porch while Jimmy fetched a jug of Hotchkiss's finest. And Jimmy and Rafay joined the others on the porch where Nate made the introductions. Jimmy Weston, Rafay Berry, meet daylight and dark although they preferred Jack Morgan and Nick Corbin. That's cause we could never tell who he was calling daylight and who he was calling dark, Jack said with a chuckle. Jack's father and Nick's mother were brother and sister, and although they shared a set of grandparents, they'd always thought of the cousins as daylight and dark. The two were as opposite in temperament and method as they were in appearance. Jack Morgan's skin was the brick red of his chuck to her mother, and only a shade darker than the Chickasaw half-breed, who was his father. His hair was as black as the abyss, and his eyes, so dark, they seemed to lack pupils. He was long-limbed, tall and straight. Jack had an untiring sense of humour and playfulness. During the war, he had shown a coolness under fire that made him a natural leader and won him quick promotion. Nick Corbin's mother, who was a light-skinned for a half-Chickasaw, to begin with, married a white man. Nick shared his father's blonde hair, blue eyes and fair skin. Nick also inherited a set of legs that were too stubby for his solid torso and muscular arms. And he was hot-tempered, ambitious and hard-driving. He was also lining fast with a six-gun. When the war broke out, their mutual grandfather urged the boys to go and fight the thieves in Washington who stole their land. And they rode to Memphis, sold their horses and caught the train for Richmond. And they were busy trying to enlist in the Virginia Cavalry when Jack called the eye, Colonel Ambrose White. White swore the pair into the Confederate Army and assigned them to a Georgia regiment. He was forming by special assignment from Richmond. Wright had plans for the Indian boys. They are kind of hard to tell apart, Nate said. These two live across the river near Oil Springs, although it's not widely known. They saved my life at Gettysburg some years ago, if you can believe that, Nick said. But it was more Jack than any we. Other than looking up old acquaintances, what are you up to these days, Jack? Nate asked. 
can you believe it? We're working for Alan Pinkerton, of all people. Though it's your fault we're, we've fallen on such hard times. Oh, and how's that? You're the one that started me looking over my shoulder for my lost troops. A couple of them turned up in our neck of the woods and caused a bit of a stir. They had the lighthouse police running in circles, so the elders asked Nick and me to step on in. The good part is, Pinkerton and the government got word of our helping out and decided to pay us to keep on doing it. We've quit waiting around for them to show up and we started hunting them instead. Well, I figured it was something along those lines as soon as I saw you. So, what brought y'all calling on me? Nate said. You know, Rafe broke in. While it's true we've had some trouble, and y'all may know old Nate, it sounds to me like you boys aren't here by chance. What's worse, to my way of thinking, is that the boss here isn't surprised to see you. Now, how about y'all letting me and Jimmy in on what's really going on? Rafe, I'll answer your question if you'll answer one for me, Jack said. Sounds fair. I ask your question. Where'd you get that limp? Jack countered. Dalton, Rafay said. Then you'll understand when I say the war has left some wounds that haven't healed yet, and maybe ain't never gonna heal. True enough, Rafay conceded. And during the war, Nick and I were officially with the 82nd Georgia, but we were often detached to various commands in the army. We were part of a special unit that was designed to enter enemy lines at night and kill. Now, I know killing sounds like the business of war, but our kind of killing wasn't the kind of killing that went on in battle. This, this was pure, indiscriminate, savage slaughter. There was no ground we were supposed to take or flank for us to cover. Our goal was to terrorize the enemy by killing in the most gruesome and imaginable way possible. Think about that, Rafi. We were there to terrorize veteran soldiers. Not an easy assignment. And we did a damn fine job of it too. My unit was made up of lunatics, murderers, and the worst cutthroats Richmond could find. The army dug these boys out of the worst pits in the south and told them they were free to kill. And they were formed into a special unit and, well, the army kind of gave them the, uh, special weapons. These killers were kept chained up and had to be guarded day and night to protect our own boys and innocent civilians. And that's where Nick and I came in. We had command of these troops in the field and were charged with keeping them corralled. Things, uh, things went pretty well until that last march out of Richmond. We were with Kershaw's troops when we were cut off from the rest of the army at Sailor's Creek. Most of Kershaw's command was captured, but some managed to cut their way out and escape. In doing so, order broke down among the scattered troops. We were out of food, weapons, and ammunition. Most of the time, we were fighting Yankees hand to hand. Hell, our men were biting, kicking, and scratching away forward. We did anything to keep from being captured by the Yankees. In the confusion, our boys lost interest in the war and didn't bother trying to find their way back to the army. They just skedaddled, and they're still running loose and practicing the skills the army taught them. And the Yankees, they had the same kind of units, but they cleaned up their mess quickly and swept it all under the rug. At first, Washington didn't seem to care about our boys. I suppose they figured these guys went back home and would confine their killing to former rebels. However, our last boys haven't been very discriminating. They still have an affinity for Yankees and have taken a liking to carpetbaggers and free Negroes too. And the radical Republicans in Congress have had enough of the violence that's being directed against their allies down here. They finally decided to do something about the killers that they left running loose. Congress contracted with Pinkerton to quietly round up our boys and put an end to the killing. And so far, we've been pretty successful. However, it is very possible one of these men is responsible for the murders at the Rockin' H. Rafe and Jimmy looked to their boss, but he was miles away. Nate stared at the horizon, oblivious to the conversation. Nate... Rafay said. Nate didn't hear. He was back at Gettysburg. It was late afternoon when his regiment was ordered across the Emmitsburg Road and into the Peach Orchard. At one point, they succeeded in driving the Yankees to the foot of Little Roundtop. 
and in a bloody seesaw the ground changed hands through the remains of the day. The light was fading fast as they came to a place called Stony Hill. The advance had slowed to a crawl. It became hard to see the lay of the ground up ahead. The muzzle flash of the Yankee guns was often the only clue to their position. Muffled voices in the jungle of canteens signalled men moving ahead and just to the left of Nate's position. He signalled to his men to take cover amid of an outcropping of large boulders and a small copse of trees. The voices grew clearer as the troops approached Nate's concealed men. Nate detected the sounds of his native Georgia in their voices. Them's our boys, Orville Pickens whispered and started in the direction of the voices. Nate caught Pickens by the arm and hauled him down to the ground. Get down, Nate ordered. How'd they get out of here ahead of us? Just stay put till I can sort this out. The moon broke over the crest of the hill and Nate could make out the light grey uniforms. Who were these boys and how did they get up here before Nate's men? Six soldiers in shackles were being marched at bayonet point. They crossed Nate's position about thirty yards farther up the hill. And thinking the guards must be Yankees, Nate was about to give the order to rush the group when he moved into a moonlit clearing. The guards wore Confederate butternut. As Nate watched, they lowered their weapons and loosed the shackles on their charges. Moonlight painted the prisoners, and a nightmare unfolded before Nate's eyes. One of the prisoners, he fell to the ground and began writhing in pain. No shot sounded, but one by one, the Romanian prisoners as if shot and howling in pain. Close up, one of the guards ordered. The guards closed ranks, forming a tight circle with their backs against one another. A ring of silvery bayonets surrounding the guards glistened in the moonlight. What the hell are they doing? Nate thought. The answer sent a shiver running down Nate's spine. In stunned silence, he watched the soldiers on the ground begin to growl and rip at their clothes. They snapped and snarled at each other like wild animals driven mad by pain. A prisoner, a tall man with dark hair, sprang to his feet. The man's ears grew into long, thin spikes, and black hair sprouted into a mat over his entire body. He turned his head towards the sky and loosed a quavering, inhuman howl. Goose flesh stood on Nate's arms, and the tall man lifted misshapen, clawed hands to the moon and howled again. The others soon joined in, filling the air with their howls, and worse than the howling, Nate could hear the sound of breaking bone. It too was coming from the prisoners, arms, legs and faces, broke apart and reformed in grotesque blends of man and beast. The tall man's jaw grew out of his face and blossomed with sharp fangs. Good God Almighty, he's turning into a wolf, Nate thought. And despite the tall man's transformation towards wolf, he remained more human than many of his fellows. One was no longer human at all. The wolfman creatures circled the guards, and they found no weakness in the circle of silvery bayonets. And suddenly, the creatures broke for the crest of the hill and towards the Yankees' lines. A few of Nate's terrified men broke and ran down the hill. The pack of wolf creatures heard them and reversed direction and started towards the fleeing soldiers. And that's, that was all the rest of Nate's squad could take. They ran for their lives. It was all in vain. The pack closed with incredible speed. The wolves ran the men down and ripped them into bloody pieces. The fragments of Nate's once brave men littered the hillside. In his hiding place, Nate, among the rocks, tasted copper and vomited bile. One of the creatures, we heard him. It was the tall man. He advanced on Nate with deliberate slowness, savoring a moment of the kill. Nate's trembling hands leveled his bayonet at a creature. Still, it advanced unafraid. Time spun out of control. The air thickened. Movement slowed and detail crystallized in Nate's mind. Along the creature's long snout, black lips pulled back in a deadly snarl and the moonlight reflected on its fangs as it salivated. Its limbs coiled together, 
the thing then hunched down, and Nate saw the muscles in its thick legs bunch. Nate sprang. Nate! Raffae shouted. Nate gasped and returned to his front porch. The Texas sun was shining, but Nate felt cold as the breeze blew across his sweat-covered arms and face. You okay, Captain? Jimmy asked. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, Jimmy, I'm fine. Nate stammered. He didn't feel fine at all. Jack was staring at him with a keen interest. Where you been, Nate? Jack asked. Copes Hill, Nate said. Everything okay there? Jack wanted to know. You tell me, Nate replied. I haven't been there in a long time. Ah, you're lucky then, Jack offered. Real lucky, Nick added. Now, well, I'd say you passed that jug along, Nate. Jack smiled. Nate passed the jug and let the dream go the best he could. He hoped the dream would keep to the daylight. However, now that it was out, Nate had his doubts it could be corralled again easily. When I saw y'all, I figured you were here about the murders. I guess bad news travels fast, Nate said. You bet it does, especially when it involves murder and the family of a Republican congressman in unreconstructed Texas. Actually, Nick and I were here in Whitesboro looking into another case when we caught wind of what happened on the Rockin' H. Your name came up and I had to see if it was the same Nate Carson I knew from the war. We figured it was the same Nate Carson we knew, or he'd be able to tell us if we were on the right trail, Jack explained. I hear the sheriff was out to talk to you, Nick added. Uh, you hear right. I think Sam's keeping an eye on me. Seems I was the last one to see Hotchkiss alive and the only one to leave tracks leading away from the Rocky H. So you were out there the other day? Nick asked. Yep, I was there all right. I went to fetch a bull John sold me. Uh, you see anything? Jack asked. You mean, did I see it? And they dropped short when he saw Jimmy's quizzical expression. No, nothing. Like that. Uh, business of yours. It was daylight, for God's sake. You know, when regular folks do business. Nate snapped. We may not be regular folks, as you put it, but ain't nothing wrong with that business. We are in the business of putting an end to senseless killing. Killing goes on in daylight and the dark. Nate. Those boys... They didn't stop being what we made them, just because the army surrendered. The killing don't stop when the war ended either. You, of all people, should know that. That's true. We kill men for a living. And some of them are men we spent the toughest four years of our lives with. And just in case you're feeling a bit righteous, don't you forget killing was your line too. The men we kill are casualties of war every bit as much as the ones you killed. Nick fired back. Looks to me like it's the ones you didn't kill that had a problem, Nate answered. Ah, that's true enough, Jack said. Now, we're asking for your help to correct that mistake. Then, they're out there? Nate asked with a wave of his hand. Yeah, they're out there. Like it or not, they're right next door, Jack admitted. Ah, the good news is we think this might be... The last direct Confederate link, Nick added. Then why involve me? Nate asked. You're already involved. No matter what your sheriff told you, he didn't just drop in to pay his respects the other day. He thinks... Well, he thinks you did it. I hear Sam Bryan's a good man, but you know, he ain't up to facing down one of our boys. Besides, you're more to help us than any local sheriff. We don't have to waste our time trying to convince you what we're up against. This too, I'm thinking, right about now. The Nate Carson I know would like a little payback for his neighbor and his old squad too. Jack smiled. Ah, you got me there, Nate admitted. That sounds real cozy, but I get the feeling y'all are leaving a bunch of this story out, Raffae said. You're damn right they are, but believe me, you're better off not knowing, Nate said. So, y'all were in Weisborough when you heard about the troubles? Nate asked. 
Yep, couple of shady businessmen were murdered there about a week ago. Well, it sounded like a handy work of one of our escapees, so we rolled in for a look-see. Nick answered. Whitesboro? Rafe asked. But y'all rode in out of the north. So we did, Jack said. You think whoever killed those men in Whitesboro killed John Hotchkiss too? Jimmy asked. Uh, given a description of what happened at the Rocky H, I say it's down near Gotterby, Nick said. The question is, why here? And where's that killer now? That's where y'all come in. We're hoping y'all can help us connect the killings here and in Whitesboro. Anything you can tell us will help. For instance, what might your friend have in common with a pair of whiskey runners? Jack said. Whiskey runners? Rafael asked. Are you sure? Positive. The dead men in Whitesboro have been smuggling whiskey to Indian territory for years. One was selling to the Comanche and the other to the Seminoles. Both of them have been crossing Chickasaw land to do it. And so we have plenty of confirmation. Somebody wanted them put out of business. Nick answered. I can't believe it. John Hotchkiss was killed over whiskey. Jimmy replied. Uh, he wasn't. Not exactly, Jimmy. Hotchkiss was killed over the money to be made selling whiskey to the Indians. Well, is there any way that John Hotchkiss was involved in selling illegal whiskey? Jack asked. No way he was involved in anything illegal. Nate said. John Hotchkiss was a straight shooter, but I'll tell you this, he makes, made, the best sipping whiskey west of the Smoky Mountains. A couple of years ago, he turned a ranch over to his son, Henry, just so he could spend his days tinkering with his recipe. That's John's stuff y'all been sitting here drinking, but he'd never sell it to the Indians. Never. You sure about that? We're talking about a lot of money here, Nate. Jack said. Kind of money that could buy, oh, let's see, a Senate seat? Absolutely sure, Nate insisted. John Hotchkiss never sold a drop to anyone, red or white. His stock was just for family and friends. John's sole reward was to see people enjoy his cooking. Besides, John didn't give a damn about Junior's political plans. But Hotchkiss did make whiskey and his son's law office is in Whitesboro. And that connects things some. But Hotchkiss did make whiskey and his son's law office is in Whitesboro. Well, that connects things some, but it doesn't take us very far, Nick observed. Nope, but it gives us a place to start, Jack said. Nate, tomorrow, would you ride into Texoma and see what you can find out about who might be moving in? If this is about whiskey money, somebody will be out of profit from Hotchkiss's death. We need to know who that might be. Meanwhile, Nick and I are going to slip over onto the Rocky Nation and have a look around. Oh, and Nate, Nick cautioned. Like Rafe said, we rode in from the north. We made a big circle so Sam Bryan wouldn't know about us being in town. We'd like to keep it that way for now. <laughs> sure thing, Nate said. The men of the Lazy L and their guests spend the rest of the evening paying tribute to the whiskey-making skill of John Hotchkiss. Jack and Nick entertained Jimmy with stories of the war and the places they'd been. Nate was relieved that they kept the stories light and stayed away from the subject of the men they hunted for a living. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What an absolutely chest-pounding and a riveting storyline coming along here from the incredible mind of my good friend Jack LaFontaine. As you guys already know, I covered one of Jack's books already, entitled Bio Moon. You can check out that in my playlist under Jack LaFontaine Stories, and also I'll leave a link to that if you want to treat yourself or a loved one to an incredible story for your collection. Lots and lots and lots of this storyline still to come out, a good few hours more. I will try to get those under my belt over the next few days and out to you guys as soon as possible. Of course, as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. Why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. 
If you're an aspiring writer, why not get in touch with myself at the usual email as on screen, which is DMT Forest to Fear at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Lots and lots of things in the pipeline, guys, and trying to find some time to get back to my own stories, such as the backpack off of the trail, the LBL second series, and uh, still trying to complete the script for the first series of the LBL to be published over on Amazon Books. Lots and lots of things in the pipeline, um, and uh, uh, quite a huge, huge development for myself, as I've been hinting for a good few months now, but uh, not going to tell you guys until it's 100% set in stone, and and yeah, it's killing me not being able to share some good news that I finally had a few months ago. But as uh, I'm sure most of you are experiencing this year, due to COVID restrictions and how much it's made daily life a struggle for anything sort of remotely the norm, certain projects have been delayed. <laughs> That's about as much information as I can give on that. Of course, a huge thank you to each and every one of my fantastic friends and writers for penning their incredible work and taking the time to send it over to myself and trusting me with such works. It really does mean the world to me and uh, I just hope I do them justice. As ever guys, I hope you're all well and happy, friends and family alike, and are trying to keep fit and focused as possible during these testing times. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>